I'm glad we could finally make this happen. We've been so excited. <laughs> Us too. Honestly, like the last two months have just been the most chaotic like, yeah. ever in our entire lives of being together. So thank you for your patience. Congrats, first of all, on your wedding. Like, oh, thank you. It's been in the works. We eloped during the pandemic. So it was, uh, yeah, we were just excited to have like our dream wedding with our friends and family. And do all that. It's a long time coming for sure. <laughs> Definitely. It looked beautiful. Like my girlfriend and I were like sobbing to your TikTok videos, like just stuff. It was so sweet, honestly. She she blew me away with her bounce, honestly. We were all like, what the heck? <laughs> I, I blew myself away. I was not, I didn't even know what was gonna happen because <laughs> I, I wrote it like morning of. You killed it. You wouldn't think it was like the morning of. I always feel like if I did that, I'd panic, but maybe that's a little better because it's just, you know, coming from the heart at that point. You're just like, this is just what I'm feeling. And here it is, right? We have been like, we were always together because we had so many things that we were both like working on for the wedding. So I think just getting like some time alone <laughs> where I could like write this, where I did I wasn't needed for something was I yeah. think the biggest challenge. So sure. pulled it off. So, <laughs> tell us a little bit about yourselves and what are your pronouns and how do you identify? My name is Jay. I identify as a lesbian if I had to put a label on it and I go by she, her. And my name is Eden. Uh, I identify as bisexual and I go by she, her as well. And do you both remember the first time you realized you might be queer? Like, was there an aha moment for both of you? I definitely have an aha moment <laughs> reflecting and we laugh about it now, but it's so cute. <laughs> it really is. Um, Anytime I had a really pretty teacher in elementary school, I made it a point to give her like the biggest bouquet of flowers and like, like Valentine chocolates and just like really go ham on like making sure they felt loved and like pretty on Valentine's Day. And I always made my mom go out of her way to get me like that bouquet and like, and it's funny because now thinking back, I'm like, she didn't think I was gay because that's not like a normal request. I would always, <laughs> I would always tell her, hey, like I need a bouquet of flowers and I need like the prettiest chocolate, chocolate mm. arrangements and like that's the biggest so heart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like, I like thinking back, like if my daughter did that, I'd be like, huh, interesting. <laughs> you might have a little crush. Yeah, for I'm sure. Like, for sure. <laughs> That's Maybe so she was about it. Maybe yeah. she knew, but... but that was like my <laughs> aha moment. Like anytime I had a pretty teacher in elementary, I was like goo goo gaga over them. No. That's so I, sweet. I, I think that was so cute. Like, I wonder if your teachers like were onto it too. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> Why does Jay keep giving me flowers and it's no longer <laughs> Valentine's Day? <laughs> yeah, that just that's just her true Pisces-ness. Like she loves gift giving. That's totally. like a big part of her love language. So it's cute to hear like little you. It's still like it's still you. It's still very much a you thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For Aww. sure. Yeah. Um me, I mean, I I think I came out later for sure I came out later in life um I think my aha moment was really uh I don't know I just I was a workaholic and I think I used to just like bury myself in work and use that as like the big excuse as to like maybe why I wasn't vibing with like my I guess like ex-boyfriends at the time and I didn't want to get married. I didn't want to have kids. So that was like never part of like my journey and my future and my like what I wanted in life. And I think like it came down to there was this like really close friend that I had that I would hang out with like all the time. And you know, when you have a friend and you're like, let's just make up for fun, you know, like it's just funsies. And so that's a part of my aha moment for sure. So yes. <laughs> It just, it, then I think I didn't realize how often I was asking for these like funsy kisses. And I think it was an aha like way later for me. Uh, I don't think I realized it until I came to LA because where I grew up in Northern California, there wasn't a lot of like gay Latinas or gay like queer people who like looked like me or that I would see around um, that were open at the time. And so I don't think I really, it clicked that like, oh, those weren't funsy kisses. Like I actually like those more than, you know, what I was getting at the time. And so I think that to me was that aha moment. <laughs> yeah. And I think the way you pointed out that there was a lack of representation is huge. And we bring that up a lot on the podcast, probably like every episode, just because even for me growing up, it took me a long time to realize I was a lesbian because I just, 
you know, I wasn't seeing anyone that really looked like me and being Indian too. I was like, I don't know you. I only saw like Rosie O'Donnell really saw Ellen, you know, and I just, yeah, you know, like it could be me. <laughs> That's Carmen. Carmen from the L word, I think was like, oh my that gosh. like, I was like, oh, she looks like me. Like, this is like her thing. This is what's happening. This is what I want. And I think once you saw that it was possible, then that's when I allowed myself to explore that route even further. And then thank goodness there was like Tumblr at the time where I got to keep like searching all Carmen's makeouts, like in different angles and all those things. And so it, it really does to your point, representation absolutely matters because once you can see that it's possible, then you can really see it for yourself. Absolutely. And I love that you brought up Carmen. Did you guys watch like the new L word Gen Q? Yeah, yeah we did. We did. Yeah, I wanted Carmen. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. We always try to support all queer representation across media. Yeah. And we were hoping for Carmen. Like we were like, this is the time to shine. This is her time to come back. She went on TikTok and said like, I'm, I'm ready. Tap me in coach. And I'm yeah. you know, all like kind of surprised. <laughs> if you guys are comfortable, can you share your coming out story or even if you had one? Oh yeah, we have, we've shared it many times. I think mine is a little more lengthy. So I came, I came out by force. Um, I wasn't planning on coming out to my family. I grew up in a very Catholic household and I knew that being gay or queer was just not in the cards for me. And I had already known that I was gay early on, like in high school, um, hence the teachers and like <laughs> always befriending the pretty girls in my classes. And yeah, my cousin who was a year younger got outed out by my by my mm-hmm. family they, they so happened to be driving by our neighborhood and they saw her make out with her girlfriend and that caused like the biggest commotion and so one day we were at a at like a garden asada like a barbecue and we were all hanging out and my mom decided to gay bash my cousin mm-hmm. it was really intense really horrible I mean every obscene word you can think of was said and I just couldn't I couldn't stand and just watch her get treated like that so I decided to just out myself um so I told my mom like you're gonna talk to her that way you might as well just say that to me because I'm also gay and that was like the end my mom was so livid um she literally grabbed me by my my hair and took me out of the party took me home and just like she couldn't believe that I had you know made a made her feel so embarrassed and she couldn't believe that I was like this lesbian like how dare I you know I'm going to hell she disowned me all in like 24 hours the very next day she checked yeah it was nuts the next day she checked me out of high school and got me a one-way ticket to live with my dad in Central America who I hadn't seen since I was like seven Mm -hmm. and she was like you can't come back to the U.S. until you're straight um so yeah (laughs) yeah it was it was intense it was a lot. And now thinking back, I'm just like, I don't wish that upon my enemies, you know, it was just very traumatic and just surreal um, to not only be taken out of like your comfort and like what you've known to be home, but now to be placed in a different home with technically strangers and in a different environment, right? Like I grew up in the US, I'm born and raised in the US and I was sent to like go to school in Central America where the kids were like, well, you're not you're not Latina enough. You're not Latina enough to like be part of our group. But then I didn't feel Latin enough being, you know, having uh, first generation parents. So it was mm-hmm. just a lot, like a lot of like trying to understand what these feelings were. I mean, that just adds trauma on top of trauma, right? Like she just accepted her sexuality and like came yeah. out and then gets banished to a whole different country. And I think that was the first time you were ever on a plane. Yeah, like, ever. this is the first time I ever was on a plane. The first time I ever flew by myself. It, oh there my was a God. lot of firsts. <laughs> Just oh, checked yeah. you out of school and said, yeah. come back when you're yeah. straight. And I lived there. I lived in, in Central America for a year. Um, once I realized that I was a U.S. citizen and in reality, I could fly back when I was 18 because technically I would be an adult. Um, then the like everything kind of switched. My mom was able to bring me back because I gave her an ultimatum. I basically said, you know, you either bring me back now or I come back when I'm 18 and I'm never going to talk to you again. Like it's, like it's kind of cut ties. Like, yeah, mm-hmm. totally. Yeah. So I came back and we sort of patched it up. I never really got an apology 
-hmm. especially in the Latino community like it's just very it's very like sweep it under the sweep it under the rug like the elders know what's best you kind of just have to abide and yeah so we kind of just swept it under the rug it was fine for a couple of years and I was able to bring girls around or like whoever I was dating but it was never really like accepted fully you know it always felt like I was stepping on eggshells or like nobody really wanted to say like Jay's girlfriend it was like Jay's friend you know is coming to dinner yeah. or it's not taken so, seriously right exactly it's like dismissed and I have I have, I have two sisters and they're both straight and it was pretty obvious how different they treated their boyfriends versus like whoever I was dating but when I brought Eden around I knew pretty early on that she was the one mm -hmm. and so I wanted my mom to like meet her and I'm pretty great with him yeah Ooh. totally and it was a whole thing I wasn't worried <laughs> yeah and like we had asked my mom if we could do like a joint Thanksgiving because her family lives in NorCal and my family's in SoCal. And like when we first started dating, we used to be close. Like, believe it or not, like her mom, like asked me to call her mom too. And like Mother's Day, she was like really like inclusive of me. Mm -hmm. She would like want to hang out all the time. Like there was a trip that we went to Vegas together. She thought it was good luck. So she asked me to sit on her lap while <laughs> she played like slots or whatever. Yeah. And I was like, okay like I, Jay's a very big bigger person I think that's where I you know learn from her and I've grown from her is that she's like so forgiving and mm -hmm. gives people chances mm -hmm. and when she told me her coming out story maybe it just wasn't for me to understand what her forgiveness journey was but I do love this person and I do want to support them and if she wants a relationship with her mom I'm going to be as supportive as possible you know as long as she like respects me as well and for the most part, like we yeah, got along, fine. like we all got along, we would hang out every Sunday. And uh, the first holiday, you know, I spent it with Jay's family, because that year was the first year I had just lost my mom to cancer. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't even ready to go back home and like, pick up where my life was. So I just told my family, I'm not going back um, to NorCal, and I'm staying in LA, and they all respected it. They didn't push me or anything. But now that it was the second holiday, I only see my family like Christmas and Thanksgiving. So I wanted to like bring up that conversation in the summer times just to like kind of test the yeah. waters, maybe like mentally prepare everybody for this conversation. Yeah. And, and so, so I asked my mom yeah. if we could do a joint Thanksgiving, we would host it at our house and everybody had to worry about anything. We would just take care of everything. And it like pissed my mom off. Really, it really ticked her off and she just immediately disowned Eden and she like didn't want anything to do with us like when it comes to fight or flight I'm definitely a fighter and so for for me I think the biggest thing I had to like do in the moment was like kind of like lock my jaw shut <laughs> as tight as I could because the moment it's opened like I don't care about like salvaging relationships. I'm the type to like cut people off and like mm -hmm. burn that bridge and never look twice. Very Gemini. So if I'm going to go out, I'm going to go out big. I was going to ask we're what your side was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Gemini. So it's like, let's, let's cut this. And like, wow. I'm, I'm going to leave like, like just ashes left. Mm -hmm. But I had to think of for the first time, somebody outside of myself. So I had no idea after this whole interaction if Jay would ever want to salvage something. So I think the best thing I can do is just like walk away. Mm -hmm. And I like my phone, left my bag, left my everything. I just like walked out the door and just like went into the car because I just was so afraid of if I opened my mouth, like there wasn't, there wasn't going to yeah. be any coming back from that. Right. And, and words so can be really like, sometimes you can't forget that, you know? So yeah, and yeah. I feel like and I don't know if it's like any other POC like communities, but in the Latino community, like it's it's very common for people to have like quick tongues, especially mm -hmm. in like the Salvadorian Central American like countries. They're just so my mom was very she cut deep. She can cut very deep, very mm -hmm. fast. And I grew up in like a very toxic environment like that. So to have her just disown me for the second time and now do it in front of my partner it was I yeah not something she could come back from it so but. really taught me a lot of empathy for Jay and like truly understanding how, like what upbringing she had and 
And like, if this is how she talks to me and she just met me, I'm trying to imagine what it was like living every day with Mm. this person and like feeling like this and being talked to like this, because this wasn't, it, this wasn't like, it didn't seem like this was like a first time like thing for her. So I, if anything, it really taught me how to have more patience and empathy when it does come to learning communication and some of Jay's like triggers and some of her defense mechanisms because you have to, she had to survive in this environment of constant defense and like dodging these like, you know, quick tongue things. So mm. like I learned a lot that day and I learned a lot about you and I have like a lot, I have, I still have a lot more empathy for like how you were raised and how you grew up aside from the coming out. Like that wasn't traumatic enough. Like seeing it firsthand, how intense it could be was just yeah. like, wow you're such a strong and like the fact that she's still like a kind and selfless amazing person and you grew up in that it just like I I, I'm so like you surprise me every day still to this day and like the strength that takes too, you know like I think forgiveness is huge and the fact that you can still kind of carry that on and be that person is it's a lot I mean the way you grow up like I mean I'm even learning that through my girlfriend too like she's Latina too and has expressed to me similar to you like words just come out or it's like a very it can be like very toxic at times especially with family and the way you grow up and even being gay in the first place it's it's tough yeah totally it's hard you know I'm I don't know I think I'm thankful because I feel like and now thinking back like I think family in general is such a is such a crazy thing because in reality, there are a lot of family members that I wouldn't be friends with in real life. If we were just, if they were just someone that I met on the street, I wouldn't like their personality. And so I feel like cutting ties with family is such a taboo topic, but a lot of the times, at least in my case, it was something that I needed to do, you know, it was holding me back a lot of the times. Right. Yeah. It was definitely a big blessing in Mm -hmm. that way. Like we, I don't know, we, we kind of had a conversation. What would what would our lives look like had we have not cut ties with that part of her family and that relationship? And our life would probably look very different. I, I didn't know at the time that Jay was like, you know, like really, you know, being financially involved with her family. And I think that is something that happens within our culture a lot where we have to take care of everybody else. Mm-hmm. And so when you finally decide to like take care of yourself, that does cause some resentment mm-hmm. to family members. But I think how how is the younger generation expected to thrive and survive if you're constantly having to take care of the older generation? And yeah. it's that like, obligation and it's that 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 feeling like you have to and it was never a choice for you yeah. when it should be a choice. It's It's expected. It's expected of you. And I think that also causes resentment on the other side. So it's a big conversation for sure. Absolutely. It's almost like you not letting go of like old traditions or or something like that. That's my coming out story in a nutshell. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But how did you two meet? Do you remember like what your first impression of each other was? Yeah, we met on Hinge, like true millennials. Um, And Eden was 45 minutes late to our first date which I will never forget. Um, she constantly reminds me, <laughs> even to the day of our wedding. <laughs> Brought um, it up in the speech, I, probably. I did, I actually, did. in a polite way. <laughs> <laughs> with reason, though. Like, with reason, she just lost it throughout the first half, but really the second half, and, like, the whole reason why anyone in my position would be late is because if you don't live on the west side, you will be late by default. So we both did not live on the West side. We lived on both in like North Hollywood area or like Highland Park area. And you decided to have the yeah. date on the West side by the beach because she had another date lined up I after did. me. I and so <laughs> I did not know that was the whole reason why we were going to Venice. <laughs> and by default, like unless you have a, a helicopter or a rocket you are not going to make it there on time like that is fair yeah I get that tell but, me more about like the first date yeah like what was that like the impression she was pissed because <laughs> I was late yeah. I was late I was I was trying to be like I was trying to be yeah I was dating in LA I was single I'm like okay I might as well just line them up and then just knock it out of the park that way I don't have to deal with it just line them all up on Saturday and so I did that and I thought first I thought Eden was a catfish because 
she was like, I'm running late. My bunny sitter is running late. Because so running she late. was. <laughs> because I do have a bunny. And there friends. are cat people. There are dog people. There are even chicken people I'm seeing on TikTok. <laughs> there are bunny people. I am <laughs> yeah. a part of the bunny community. And I've always had a rabbit since I was growing up. Aww. And that rabbit I had at the time. I wasn't supposed to. My apartment was like no pets allowed. But I mean, it's not like she makes noise or like anyone's ever going to find out. So I've, I've snuck her into many apartments in LA. <laughs> and my landlord was just like, by the way, I'm moving your inspection up a week. So I'm going to need you and you going to need you to like have your apartment ready. I'm going to go look through it while we were on our date. And I was like, Fuck, okay, what am I going to do? Uh, I have a go to friend who knows how to handle rabbits and is like my bunny sitter. So she was running late, therefore I was running late, therefore I got to this day, like 45 minutes because I'm on the other side of town. I just told her the truth. I was like, my yeah. bunny sitter is running. I kept giving her live text mm-hmm. messages all the way up until. Yeah. And Jay's and... like, yeah, right. What do you mean bunny I know. sitter? Exactly. <laughs> She's like, my bunny sitter is running late. I'm going to be like 30 minutes late. Uh-huh. And I, I would, at that point, I swore she was a catfish. Yeah. I was like, there's no way. She's definitely a catfish. Who has a bunny in LA? Like, that's so weird. <laughs> well, and well, now, now that I know you, now that I, I know, like, the bunny community, I Great totally see it. Pet. But at the time, I was like, there's no way. So I was live texting my best friend, and I was telling her, hey, like, I think I'm just going to bounce. I don't think this girl's real. Like, she's talking about a bunny, and she's, like, 30 minutes late. And I have another date to go to. Like, I'm okay. I'm good. I'm going to skip it. I actually and- called my best friend and I was like crying because I was running late and I I don't know what it was and I've never taken like a, a, just for even my own like I have been even more late to dates in 45 minutes Wild. just because I, I don't think I was in the right headspace to date so instead of like tapping out like a normal person should or like a decent human being should uh, I was still going through it so mm-hmm. I wasn't in the right headspace to date but for whatever reason like before I even saw her or met her I was so excited about this date and I was so nervous about it and I was so sad that I was late and I was telling my best friend who was a cancer and you know if you if you if you want to hear something good don't call up the cancer like they will just tell you how it is and <laughs> straight up I like I don't think she's ever gonna talk to me again she's like she's probably not you're wasting your time you should just turn around and I'm like but like I have to see this through and she's like well she's not gonna talk to you I don't know what you want to talk why did you call me for like it's not gonna be good news and then so I just like hung up the phone and cried and then finally got to see you yeah and and we're so not I, happy. I stayed only because my <laughs> best friend at the time was like you should just wait it out like just just she, wait it out. she had another date after me that's why she stayed <laughs> the, you were funny. still there <laughs> but so it wasn't like the best restaurant either because they wouldn't seat you until your whole party was there so she oh, had to like wait right. outside on the street yeah even worse right so that was even a bigger reason why I wanted to dip because uh. I couldn't even a drink I could yeah, like have a drink and chill no it was like on the curb outside (laughs) for 45 minutes so I'm like running up in my little heels and I'm just like I'm coming I'm coming and she looks so pretty like she is just everything that like her pictures were but like her pictures didn't do her justice and she just is oozes this like coolness and like mysteriousness and sexiness but also I am pissed Duh. <laughs> I don't even know her yet and I have a feeling like she's mad because it's like very quick one word answers and so I'm like all right let's just get to the table let me just get us some alcohol and then like hopefully this will like blow over a little bit right and the waiter literally sassafras was like oh so you do exist because I was starting to think that you weren't even real either and I was like <laughs> okay to be one yeah totally I was venting for him and he's like oh that sucks why would she send you up like I didn't say you up you made it. so he definitely had to find his two cents real quick yeah, yeah. I was not on my team at that point but we we got there and I think that was kind of the biggest like blessing in disguise because I felt like I had nothing to lose on that date because she was never going to talk to me again. She was never oh, going to give me a So chance. you're like, you know what? Let's just like make the most of this night. It's Let, pretty much like just, a no. It, yeah. It's more of like a, I have nothing else to lose. Like, so don't worry about putting on your best front. Don't worry about like, you know, saying all the best parts of myself. I'm just going to say the honest parts of myself. And so we just kind of went in with very deep and like real questions very quickly 
like the first one she even asked was just like why are you single and I thought that was like a very fair question and I told her like I had just lost my mom to cancer like four Mm -hmm. months ago it's I I don't feel like I'm in a good space to you know find someone because when she died she took half of my heart with her and I don't feel like anybody can love somebody with only half a heart and that's how I truly feel right now and it was just like all cards on the table whatever you want to know I'm not hiding anything and um and we were just having very very raw honest conversations like I talked to her about her relationship with her mom and her family and like what are goals that she has in life and maybe it was like you know just getting to it right just getting to like really know somebody on not a superficial level like not what's your favorite color what's your favorite food but what really makes you who you are and like hours had gone by and we hadn't touched a single part of the food, which we also learned that this restaurant was like family style. So we <laughs> ordered like a salad and a pasta and a couple other things, but they were like for feeding a family. So <laughs> we had a table where we could have fed a village and I like hate, hate, hate wasting food. Like I just like there's so many hungry people out there and I just was so nervous. I couldn't eat either, I, but yeah. we did kill a whole bottle. Because like maybe two of them. Was, the wine was flowing. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> the wine was flowing and the conversations were flowing and that's all that mattered. But yeah, Aww. at the end of the day, it's funny because I kept going to the restroom to text the other date, remember? Because I have another date. And I was like, hey, so sorry. Like I'm running late. Um, I'll get there in like an hour. You should have used it. Your bunny sitter is running late. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, yes. Yeah. And she was like, yeah, no worries. Like my friends just got here. It was a second date with that person and oh, okay. it was like a friend yeah so I was like oh I'll be there in like an hour because thinking that the date was going to end there right because we were already done with the wine and Eden goes oh do you want to go find someone to give the food to we should pack it up and go and like my heart just sank because mm-hmm. like I, I at the time I was volunteering at like homeless shelters and like I've always been down to feed the homeless and just help those that need help. And yeah. so when she said that, I was just like, oh no, she's pulling out my heartstrings. Yeah, you're so like, oh. attitude, like yeah. do not let this date end because the moment she does, she's going to like realize that <laughs> she's mad at me and that she's not going to talk to me. And so my thought process like was just keep it going, keep it going. So I was like, let's go feed the homeless person now. Let's go like sit on the beach and watch a sunset. Now let's go watch a movie. Yeah. And then after the movie, I'm like running out of things because now it's coming to the end of the night and I'm like granted by the third request I just like text the, my second day and I was like I'm so sorry I'm like not, I can't make it I yeah. can't make it I'm so sorry she's yeah. so mad <laughs> <laughs> rightfully so um but yeah and then we yeah you ended up asking me to the movies that night and we went to the movies and we saw Lion King because I was like the only thing I could quickly search very, very fast like yeah, what was what, what was playing the Beyonce Lion King it was, it was the Beyonce nice. Lion King so after you know it's not like we don't know how this ends right so we're sitting there nobody like makes a move nobody crosses arms over nobody tries to like yawn and like we were just sitting like we were in an airplane like <laughs> nobody even like did to like put their arm on the armrest like it was just straightforward and didn't share popcorn nothing and so I'm thinking like maybe this girl still is really mad at me and I was just a shy Pisces, that's all. I and, get that. Uh, like, nerves can, like, make you shut down, too. I actually really get that. Yeah. I didn't know she was nervous. She was mad. Yeah, I was nervous. And then, like, uh, Simba becomes king. The little credits roll. And I'm, like, I am running out of things. And so I'm trying to, like, think really quickly as we're, like, walking to say goodbye because I'm determined, like, to not say goodbye. And so she was, like, you know. Granted, like, our we, date started at, like, 3. I and know. it's 10 p.m. now. Oh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> we were going and then so I was like uh she was she asked me random questions so I was like oh what do you have planned for the rest of the night or like the week or something I was like oh well I'm switching apartments in my apartment and I have to move and politely she was just like oh like I could help you pack if you ever need help Aww. and I was like great I can help right now like actually she like I need help today. Tonight, if I want to help you pack right now like you can I could really use the help if you if you really mean what you say and then she was like, okay, like, I'll help you pack your apartment. <laughs> I guess I'll come over and help you pack. That oh, my of- God. I love this. I, like, rushed over. I got, like, another bottle of wine. I got Taco Bell because we hadn't, at this point, we hadn't eaten all day. Yeah. And I'm, yeah. like, starving. 
I love Taco Bell. It's such Which like is crazy because I love Taco Bell. It's my favorite <laughs> like fast food guilty pleasure. So oh, when she said so that, so good. This girl can't be any more perfect. Like, yeah, wild. And we're still on our first date today. <laughs> Like, it I never ended no I never let it stop because the moment I do like she's yeah. gonna realize you're ridiculous that and I'm so mad at you for being late <laughs> you're still <laughs> waiting for that moment to like let it set in for Jay <laughs> we're gonna sign off the spot interview and Jay's gonna be like wait a minute yeah I'm actually bad I'm still mad at you I'm actually <laughs> mad what am I doing here <laughs> now she's gonna come to her senses so I gotta <laughs> keep it going it, what's up there's like a story it's like something about the thousand thousand nights I feel like I'm hurt I just like keep the night going I just keep the story <laughs> going that's so funny so. I feel like that's every classic like gay date you know what I mean like it lasts a long time when you really connect yeah. with someone you like don't want it to end no never it's yeah so typical millennial queer date yeah exactly well, actually diving into this and like kind of stereotypes, there are a lot of stereotypes in queer relationships, like you hauling. There's also gender roles when I, I don't know if you two have gotten this, but like who is the man in the relationship? Um, yeah. Also like lesbian bed death, which is like dry spells when you go through periods of that. Why do you think queer relationships like have those stereotypes? Well, no, each stereotype I think stems from something, right? Like some like within every I don't know fairy tale there is like some truth to it or like the story had to come from something um and I don't just depends on you know how you believe in it and and making it a negative thing like we you hauled I don't see that as a negative a thousand thing percent. we literally moved in six months after knowing each other and we got married a year in like we eloped a year in and we moved yeah. in together six Granted, our first day I just got the keys to my new apartment so I had to break lease <laughs> like just a few months in yeah. and so like we we completely u-hauls and we just didn't yeah, I will say like I don't I don't know to your point I don't see a negative in that because I feel like u-hauling isn't really a bad thing because it just means that you're asking all the like you're doing all the serious things up front versus prolonging it through the years yeah I don't know but we we go back like we just did this post on social media where we summed up kind of the last four years of our relationship. And we like, that was a part of our story. Like we obviously, we had a first date and like we, you hauled, we went through the pandemic together. We were able to do IVF and start a movement and, you know, do social media. There's like so many different things that we've done, but I think we were able to do so many different things because we knew like, this was it and we moved quickly had we had waited I don't know two or three years to move in or a year whatever the minimum is that society puts on you to do all of these things now we have to date uh, two more years and now we have to get married in another year now we have to like have our marriage for a year and then think about kids like whose timelines are these like and it's it's just whatever feels right to you and sometimes I think as women like we want to get just get to it and then I don't think you hauling is necessarily a bad thing you can decide whether you're into it or not fairly quickly and then make an educated decision based off of that and like, I think you hit the nail in the coffin I think that's what makes you hauling or puts the the negative conversation on on you hauling is that people don't take the time to actually see if that person is the right person to move in with or take it to the next level there's a lot of like just jumping the gun before even asking those those really serious questions up front and mm-hmm. I was in a group of, of lesbians I was a one bisexual in this group of lesbians and all of them were telling me don't move in with her because I had a really sick apartment I had like a two-story two-bedroom three-bathroom loft for like 1600 and they're like, unheard of unheard of they're like you're never gonna I mean granted That's that was kind of like yeah yeah they were like don't let that go you're never gonna find another apartment but I was just like yeah but I'm never gonna find another girl like her either so if I'm gonna choose yeah between the two I'm gonna choose her and it was interesting to hear like that that you know don't be a u-haul don't be a stereotype don't be this and I and I just was doing what felt right to me but had I listened to everybody else tell me that u-hauling was wrong or that it's a bad thing or that it's a cliche stereotype we wouldn't be as far as we are now because we're doing what everybody else tells us to do which is to wait like if you want to just get to it and figure out if you like this or not, just go, just like try it out. And I you completely know. agree. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, because like, was- what- <laughs> I love that. But like, exactly with you hauling, like, why does society have a say in that to be like, you need to date for like this amount of time before you move in together? Like, you learn so much about each other in that time. And like you said, you kind of make that call, like no one's like locking you into that, like you can make the decision, like, does this work for me? Or does it not? Yeah. yeah. And I, I don't know, I find it funny, especially when people ask, like, who's, who's the man in the relationship? It's like, neither. We both come. That's the problem. That's, that's why we're <laughs> together. Like, there's no, one needs a man. <laughs> no one needs to be the man. And it's these like gender norms and these like ger- gender like stereotypes, right? Like I, I there is no man that is, is the point. And I don't think anybody needs to be the man. Like we both carry our weight in completely different ways and in ways that you may not expect. Like I love to fix and build things. And I'm like, I present, I guess, in the most feminine, girliest way possible, but anything that breaks I'm like on the roof and I'm fixing things I'm like reading manuals I will read a manual front to back and like rebuild something and take it apart like that's Ikea that's my jam like I love to like do those things and Jay is like again she's like more in the kitchen and loves Mm -hmm. to cook and then I'm like fully tatted everybody assumes that I'm like the super like (laughs) no I'm the soft one (laughs) she makes me so much softer and I love that about her we're so opposites in that way and if I didn't have somebody who was as opposite as me I I wouldn't be the person I am today and like vice versa I think I bring the toughness out of her I like I push her in those different types of ways Mm -hmm. that she's probably never been pushed before and yeah we bring a lot of balance but there's no man and you don't need a man to have that type of balance you know absolutely not yeah, that's just like a class, <laughs> classic society again for you, right? Yeah, because exactly. I think it, it's like needed. Like I can open a spaghetti jar. Like don't. The, I mean, it's all about working smarter, not harder, too. Like to just stack the tops and you know just oh we'll my figure gosh. it out. Or those like little grip things. Like, have you ever used one of those? I could never, for the life of me, open up any jars. And now with that little grip, like get them at like a Dollarama. Yeah. Oh, like game changer. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. Like, <laughs> otherwise I was like, I'm gonna like smash this jar. Like, I don't know what else to do. <laughs> what am I gonna do? The, the stereotype is like, you need a man. And I think yeah. we've proven like within like a society and our relationships that you don't need it. Like we will all survive. We can all build shit and like figure it out on our own. Doesn't matter what you look like. Like, if it, you know, if you want to do it, you'll do it, you'll figure it out. Exactly. <laughs> And do you guys know anything about like lesbian bed death? Like, I don't know if that's like a super common stereotype, but I've heard it like a little bit. Yeah, no, uh, it, from what I know is that it, you've been in a long-term relationship and then you stop having sex. Like Mm -hmm. it's kind of like just, or it's, it's decreased a lot. And I can see where that would happen in most queer relationships. People get comfortable. uh, No one's really trying anymore. And I think that has a lot to do with, with dating your partner too. Like we're adamant about Mm-hmm. wooing each other even after being married you know and I think people have this mis- misperception that you need to stop dating your partner once you're in a committed relationship and that's just not true you know it's almost like it's almost like owning a car and taking it to get fixed like you're taking you need the car needs to have an oil change every so often and I think that in order for that car to run it's the same thing with a relationship in order for that relationship to to be healthy and yeah. and have a you know a healthy like sexual love life yeah like, love like life. intimacy like depending on I mean there are there are always different cases right you have like high libidos you have yeah. low libidos we we have opposite libidos but we still find ways to make it work I do feel like it it's an unfair I think lesbian bed death like analogy to use because I think that's just normal within any relationship because when say, you're yeah. when you're dating it's just you're not you're not dealing with the stressors of having to provide for your partner like you haven't merged all the things the bills the responsibilities the like life pressures like those haven't kicked in yet but once you live life and you're building a life together the priority is like survival it is paying bills it is like reaching these goals and a lot of your priorities and how you use your time like switches and I don't think that's unfair I don't think that is like the end-all be-all that you stop loving or you stop wanting your person I think it's just having open communication Mm -hmm. about intimacy and what you need and that is huge and that is key especially if somebody needs it more than the other person 
And you, you don't want to, not to say that that leads to infidelity, but you don't want your partner to feel neglected. And I think that is the biggest misconception is that I don't like saying lesbian dead bed death because it's just like when you stop having like sex and when you stop being intimate, like it can make somebody feel like lonely or neglected. That is a reality. Every cause of action has a reaction. But mm-hmm. if you have communication about like, what each other needs and how you can meet in the middle and you're not going to hit it every single time but as long as you're trying Mm -hmm. like Jay was saying as long as you're constantly checking in and checking that oil and checking with your partner and vice versa it's like it's you're both are trying to keep this thing alive and keep it moving forward but it's just also having an understanding of what the expectation is for Mm -hmm. sure yeah definitely And I was going to point out too, one thing I love about your guys' social media is how you really like promote healthy queer relationships and like healthy communication. And we just wanted to know what are three things every listener can do to help like nurture a healthier relationship with their partner? Yeah, that's a great question. I think one of the things is creating safe space. Mm -hmm. I, when we first started dating, I, my communication skills were so low like on the floor I would shut down often like I didn't know how to you know articulate how I was feeling in a in a positive or healthy way and Eden and I created safe space so Eden basically said like you know this couch is safe space meaning like if you need to say anything whether it's good or bad or like whatever just get it out on this couch without any kind of repercussion Because as we mentioned earlier, I was raised in like a really toxic, traumatic environment where it was like yelling 24 seven and just like, so it was hard for me to just, just, just have a normal conversation when something would upset me Mm -hmm. and creating that safe space. I, I feel really helped my communication skills and unlearning, like helped me unlearn a lot of trauma in the way that I felt safe. Like for once I was able to just speak my mind without having to lie or, you know, um, minimize what I'm trying to say to not hurt her feelings, but just, yeah. just be. I think the biggest misconception about having it, or the hardest part about having safe space and open communication is allowing your partner to be honest mm-hmm. without judging them, without getting mad, because that's what causes the lies. That's what causes the people pleasing. That's what it mm. causes the walking on eggshells because they don't feel like they can tell you the truth. And mm. what we always tell our listeners is don't be mad for your partner being honest yeah. because that's what causes like all this other, you know, resentment and back ended. So as long as they're honest, whatever that truth may be, appreciate the honesty first and foremost, and then deal with whatever comes after that. But you have to come from a place of love Mm -hmm. and not a place of like anger or resentment or your own trauma, because it's not going to give whatever the problem is a fair fight to find and like a healthy solution to it. And I think once we realize like, not only do we have to create safe space, like, and this is going to be an uphill battle, this is going to be a lot of work because we both have things that, you know, trigger us and that we're working on in our communication we need to at least give each other a place to be honest because if we can't be honest with each other, then I don't know what we're doing. Like that, that's, that's the bare minimum that we both need is honesty. And that's, what's going to really open up the rest of like the foundation for communication, because if your partner can be honest with you, then we can like work on everything else after that. Like that is our baseline. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's honesty. Let's start and like feel safe and, you know, and, work with it I think the second biggest thing that we always tell our our listeners is that understanding your person's love language and communication style those are two completely different things and do not put the pressure of your partner knowing your love language and understanding your communication style as something that's second nature to them because they have their own and so it's really just remembering like they don't think the way that I do. They don't right. love the way that I do. They don't communicate the way that I do because we're both speaking two separate different languages and we're trying to communicate something together. Mm-hmm. So giving each other patience and understanding, like if you're not sure, don't assume. Like if you hear something that set you off, it's better to ask and say like, hey, did you did you mean it that way? And it can completely be different. Like 
it, we have two different styles. We have two different ways of talking and tones where I think that she might be upset about something. And she was just like, no, I was just saying what, what it was. <laughs> like, it was just that. And it's like really rechecking ourselves and putting it back on us before we start pointing the finger at our partner. Yeah. Like, Cause it can be easy to do that. That's almost like yeah. a defense mechanism. So easy to be like, well, you said that. No, what it is, is like what I heard was yeah. blank. It's really reframing it back and putting it on yourself first and giving your partner the option to like either explain or confirm like, oh, they really are upset. Now you, now you're opening the floor to be like, okay, well, why are you upset? Like mm-hmm. what is happening? What is going on? It's that it's really putting it on yourself first before you dump something on your partner, because most of the time it's, you're dumping your own stuff onto them. And it, it's, it's this communication dance again is not easy, but it's also understanding like she's coming from a different place and I am, I'm coming from a different place and she is and giving each other grace and space to like be able to still be ourselves and communicate the way that we're going to do. Because if I try to force her to communicate like me, it's not going to end well. <laughs> it's not going to get us very far and vice versa. So just once you accept that and just learn how to communicate with your your person in their way, I think makes it a lot easier for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like you <laughs> project a lot. On, like projection is really huge. Um, Like kind of taking our own personal like triggers and just like dumping that. And um, mm-hmm. yeah, I've been guilty of that too. And I'll tell my partner later, I'm like, I was truly projecting. Exactly like you said, it's not like what you said, it's how I heard it. And mm-hmm. that's like my own shit, like I need to work on, you know? Yeah, but at least oh. you're acknowledging it. Like you're on the right step, you know. It's on you. Yeah, it's yeah. your partner. Big thing that she's had to teach me is how to say sorry. Yeah, like yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm not the biggest person. That's not like my favorite thing to do. Is like yeah. say sorry. I would rather just like fix the problem and then rather than just be like, like I'm sorry because now I feel like over backtracking and all those things. But it's needed. Yeah, just because I don't feel like I need it doesn't mean that she doesn't need it. And so she needs an acknowledgement of like what had happened and what went wrong and what I did wrong. So like saying sorry was really big for me. And I think I struggled with like, why do I struggle saying sorry? Why am I holding all of my sorries? Like I have only this limited amount in the bank. And if I give one out, I'm like one short. Like it's just, I'm going <laughs> to run out of them someday. So I'm like, literally, <laughs> I'm holding my sorries for when I really like need them. Yeah. No, it's. Like it's I have an unlimited amount of sorries to give out. So just start handing them out whenever they're needed and yeah. like understand what it means to be sorry and like figuring out like that is something that is a part of life and learning and making mistakes and being sorry for when you make a mistake or if I, you know, made her upset in some type of way. And that I think is like third for us is just acknowledgement and apologizing yeah. like don't hold your sorries don't hold like all of this in just acknowledge it and, and I think like, heal just to add to that sorry I think there's a difference between just saying sorry and like saying what you're sorry for mm-hmm. and how you're gonna change like like I think a sorry has three different steps and mm-hmm. a lot of people just say sorry and expect that to be enough but there yeah. should be acknowledgement it's there not enough understanding <laughs> and there should be like a game plan for it to not or work on that thing that you're sorry for you yeah know? like so the action us, that comes like, with it yeah like I need the whole res- like give me the whole play-by-play it's like I, I I'm sorry I'm sorry for doing this and I will be doing this better in the future it's yeah. just like this whole full circle that is an, an actual apology and not like I'm sorry let it be I'll say sorry when I do it again. Like, no, it's like, I acknowledge what I did wrong and I'm going to do better next time. Definitely. Oh, I think I'm in a little like therapy session right now. Like, awesome. I'm like taking notes. I was like, yes, thank you. Yeah, they, sorry, working on that. <laughs> exactly. No, this is actually great. And I was going to say this kind of like, you already answered this pretty much, but um, how do you like, what do you feel is the best way to approach conflict? I, I think you guys pretty much like summed it up, but if you find yourself in that situation, what would you do? I think just like conflict for us, it's all about creating the, the space to have it. You know, we have a rule, which we've had since day one, um, 
I'm not a fan of cussing and I don't like my partners cussing at me. Like, it's just yeah. not what I, it's what I grew up in and it's not what I want to continue to have in my life. Mm -hmm. And so for us, it's very important that even in our most heated arguments, like there is no name calling of each other, you know, there's no calling each other out of our, our names. You can be upset and you can be mm -hmm. angry, but I think there's a healthy way to do that. Yeah. And so it's like setting those ground rules. I feel like the best way we could break it down for people, if you, if y'all are gonna argue, because it will happen. Yes, it happens yeah, to it, it happens to everybody. Like that Absolutely. is a part of life. You need to be like having something with your partner, mm -hmm. just like you're di two different human beings, right? So I think just one, I love where Jay's coming from. I think our biggest one that we also use is, I'm gonna fight for this. I'm not gonna fight against it. So at the end of the day, we have to be in this together and finding a solution together. So like, let's just put the even playing field out. We're both going to have to give up something and we're both going to gain something from this and we're going to work through it together because it's not me versus you. It's not I'm right, you're wrong. It's not who wins or loses because then that creates this like different power dynamic between the relationship and like how you argue because at the end of the day, like, are you arguing to to argue to make somebody feel less than? Because mm. that's not that's not a reason to argue. You shouldn't be like, you made me feel bad, so I need to make you feel worse. Like, that's just not healthy. That's just not what we do. But I will say, if you're going to have a conflict, there is a problem that needs a solution. Now, what we've learned is that not every conflict that has a problem needs a solution. I am a person that needs to solve a problem. I am a fixer through and through, I will build stuff. I, I like crossing things off lists and being done with them. Jay sometimes doesn't need a problem to be fixed. She just needs to be heard. Mm. That doesn't make sense to me, but it's not for for it to make sense to me. She's like, I need to, co I need to complain about something. I have this problem and, and she needs to get it off her chest and like, just like, you know, have some type of like discussion that's like you know about this thing that's bothered her and my initial thing is like well I need to fix it sometimes that's not that's not it that's not what she needs so what we've learned like when it comes to conflict what helps at least my brain is like okay do you do you need me to fix it or do you need to be heard and then she can tell me like I need you to help me fix this like we need to fix it this is a problem and sometimes it's not sometimes it's like I just need you to listen mm -hmm. and sometimes it's the hardest part for me <laughs> like <laughs> it's, it's, it's like come natural it's come natural because in the back of my mind I'm like I want to fix it I want to fix it I want to fix it yeah. but it's not a problem is for me to fix like yeah. sometimes she needs to fix things on her own and she wants to and sometimes she just wants somebody to hear her out and like as she's figuring out how to fix it on her own so it's also being loving and supporting your partner and knowing how to love and support them and how they need it not necessarily how they want it it's like how do they how do they need it and sometimes she just needs to go through it on her own sometimes she tells me she like wants to learn the hard way like and that's fine because she knows I'm a I'm, I'm a fixer and I don't if I fix every problem for her then she doesn't learn like the way that she wants to yeah so we've like figure out that dynamic with each other but when it comes to conflict like you got to figure it out you're in it together it's like you're both are in a boxing ring you yeah. guys are you just gonna beat each other up until it's done it's like no like you both got to put down the gloves acknowledge that you're in a ring and like talk it out yeah absolutely because like you said it's inevitable like if there's mm -hmm. not conflict like obviously there's something missing right like we're you're two different people like in something together on this journey together and yeah, it's just how you deal with it and understand each other. So that's that's really good advice, honestly. I wanted to get into marriage and children with you guys as you did just um, get married and you are on this like IVF journey. But I wanted to know, when was the moment you both realized you wanted to marry each other? Yeah, great question. <laughs> um, I think I realized I wanted to marry Eden on our third date, fourth date in handcuffs. Fourth date. Fourth date. We were in handcuffs and I realized she was the one. <laughs> That's a yes, really great I, way to start that. I love it. I, I you know, it's it's funny because I was joking. I was like, okay, universe, like the next person you throw into my life better be a ride or die. Like I want somebody to be in it with me that can like go through the waves because like when you when you lose somebody that you love, you realize how hard and intense life can be. And I had just gotten out of a relationship at that time and it really was such like a lonely and hard experience to go through by myself and my you know ex just didn't want any part in that in that journey with me so I was like I need somebody no matter how hard it gets they're not gonna like get scared and they're not gonna let life like 
have them run away. And so I just thought it was very ironic because it's like one of those be careful what you wish for things because like <laughs> once you're in handcuffs and the police officer is like saying you can go she's going to jail and she's like oh I'm going with her like oh, I'm gonna no. ride with her and it was our fourth date where she didn't really need to like owe me anything like she could have just like been like you know what this is a lot I'm gonna <laughs> this is only our fourth date that was sure. also the first night she told me she loved me too I did I told you I loved you right before <laughs> the uh this before the handcuff situation <laughs> i was like if you don't meet if you want to take it back it's okay it's, it's fine I won't, take it, I won't hold it against you but no she she yeah. still meant it and i think for me it was i i put it in our vows it was it was our second date and like i it it was crazy because like, we share so much of our lives online and the reason like really why i was like holding on to that that story was because i knew i wanted to marry her and i wanted to like it was it was really cool to have that memory in my phone that saved that that date and that timestamp of when I was just like I want to marry this girl and I wanted to like I didn't know when that would be I just knew like that was it for me and that was like that moment on our second date and I was able to share that on our wedding day and it was just like it was worth the wait and I know a lot of our followers would be like I want to hear the second date and the third date and I'm like no like I'm holding on to that and to like not I couldn't really like make it too big of a deal because she would be like why don't we talk about our second date and I'm just like why don't we talk about any other day <laughs> well like hold it special so, to you right you know um, yeah like cherish that yeah so it was it was really cool to be able to do that for her and to like see that all the way through I'm very much like Jay lives in the now and I live in the future and that's also something that we're complete opposites like I'm eight steps ahead and she's just like yeah I'm just enjoying what's happening on step one <laughs> but she does ground me to like be more present because yeah. I'm always like okay, always on the go always on the go like what's happening next 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 and so for me I played the long game I was like I, I I wanted to save this for whenever that day would be so I saw it like for a future I don't know when I don't know how but it was really nice to see that work out. <laughs> yeah, no, that's sweet. Um, what has been the biggest surprise and the greatest challenge in planning a queer wedding? So we we knew we wanted to have like a very traditional Catholic wedding as a queer couple. And that like in itself is pretty complicated because we're not technically we're not we can't legally get married in a, in a Catholic church because we're gay. So mm -hmm. it's like this catch. But we knew we wanted to do a calenda, mm -hmm. which in Mexican culture, when you get married or have a baptism or it's like your quinceañera or whatever, like any big accomplishments, straight weddings, they have these like city marches where the entire city comes out and they celebrate like whatever it is that you've accomplished. And there's like dancers and it's a, it's a giant parade. It's insane. Yeah. And I knew I wanted to do that for our wedding. And when we searched online or on TikTok, like, okay, lesbian calenda or like queer calenda, nothing came up, like not one wow. video. Yeah. So we were like, okay, this is what okay. we want. And this can be, um, how's this going to go? Yeah, like, yeah. It could be a little troubling because you don't know. I mean, granted, Mexico is pretty um, advanced. Like they, they you know, they they have gay rights. They believe in women's rights. They're pretty ahead of their time but nobody had ever done it before so that was one of the things that we were kind of dreading the back of our heads because it could go one of two ways right yeah. one the whole city can just embrace it and it can be this magical thing or two you can have a bunch of homophobic people that join the march and you know are upset that we're like you know messing displaying our love like because we the calendar tradition like you go all the way to the church like that is what it is like you we can't pick a different route and it was, you know, something that we warned our like bridal party or like everybody, all of our guests that were coming, like, hey, we're going to do this thing. Like, if you're planning on attending our wedding, please know, like, this could be a possibility um, because we have no data. Like, I'm all about data and numbers. <laughs> like, I have nothing to pull reference from. And I think that to me gave me the most anxiety and to like, it goes back to like how we first talked about representation how much it matters as soon as you've seen it done before it gives you a little bit of peace of mind and knowing that it's possible so mm -hmm. I think not having oh it's like emotional not mm -hmm. having that reference to like pull from really just made it like we're gonna do this thing and we don't know 100% if it's going to be embraced or if it's people are going to attack us or be upset but we're gonna do it anyways 
and it's not just for us it's for everybody after us because I would hate for somebody to feel that way like yeah to look for something that Google is saying like it's not here like people who look like doesn't exist like why are you even searching this thing you know because it's not for you and so we were like our wedding is so much bigger than us and it's bigger than just her and I and we wanted to let other people know like if this was something that you wanted and that you you know want in your journey and in your love story you can have it because if we can do it you can do it like absolutely yeah yeah so that's that, beautiful that was yeah. one of the things that was a little complicated but it turned out to be scary. amazing <laughs> but it was incredible it was my beautiful. favorite part honestly like seeing so many uh, I mean 99% of our our family and friends were queer so just seeing so many queer people in the streets dancing and you know with their partners and yeah. just embracing Aww. the culture insane queer trans like non-binary everybody in between like it, it was like it felt like our own little pride march through like Oaxaca <laughs> and it was so cool to see everybody be so supportive it was like a, a pleasant surprise to see how yeah. embraced we were and the fact that we were both wearing dresses too because I think maybe it could have been easier if she was wearing a suit and maybe it would have helped people's brains a little bit but we were like we both want to wear dresses this is our thing and it was it was embraced and our whole bridal party and like our whole family got to be a part of it and be a part of this culture and yeah. make these incredible memories so yeah that was I think like and I think key. that yeah that's one and the second thing for us with planning our core wedding is that we're such perfectionists and I think that is like plays a big role yeah. in it <laughs> because we've been throwing you know queer but events the night, but it's yeah. just the nights like for the last year right that we are so we can catch things like we're very quick on details. And so our wedding was nothing different. We were like, we want this at this time. We want this, these colors. This has to look a certain way. It which... felt like a preciosa on steroids yes. <laughs> that was like very bougie. And, and granted the preciosa that we had right before that, we threw a festival. Like we yeah. threw our very first queer festival. It was free to the public. We had performers that performed at Coachella. We had art and like at least um, um one person from every like performer was queer. So we had like an all queer lineup that were yeah, also all queer. The DJs were all queer. They were all Latina. And it, it was just a, an incredible magical moment. And we did that like July 1st. And then we got married July 29th. So we just came off of like planning this like 10,000 person event. Just the That's two insane. of us. Yeah, yeah, it was at Pershing Square. It was nuts. And it was free. It was, it was free, free for yeah. everybody. And we did that. And just to like look back and be like, okay, now we have to plan our wedding. Now we had to like figure out our wedding. We didn't have dresses at the time. Like we just made it all work. And, yeah. you know, and well, that's the thing. Like we give so much of ourselves for our community, but we don't brag about it. We're not like, hey, like this is, you know, people saw a beautiful wedding, but they have no idea like what it meant to us and like why we did the things that we did. It wasn't for clout. It wasn't for followers. It wasn't for anything. It was because like we wanted to show people, like we don't want people to feel the way that we feel. Like yeah. we want to create these Places. we want yeah. to make a difference like what's the point of being an influencer if you don't have something positive and, and impactful to influence like I'd rather just lose it all if I'm not gonna make make a difference in this world and that's Absolutely. we didn't start social media to to be followed we started it to make a difference and to make a difference for people who are brown not just Latina like mm -hmm. people who are brown and like black and like mixed colors what you even if you're light-skinned if you're white whatever mm -hmm. like if you just feel like you you know, can relate to our story in some type of way. Like we welcome like all walks of life and you'd be, you'd be pleasantly surprised of like how many people kind of like yourself have no idea the things that we do all the time and like how much we try to give back to the community. And we sometimes like don't even take a step back because we're always, I'm always thinking like forward and Jay's like, we have to like really understand that we just did this thing. And I'm like, yeah, but what about the next thing? <laughs> like sit in the moment and like just, yeah, enjoy it. yeah yeah constantly a reminder but yeah I think that those were the most like yeah I think crazy, the most challenging, most challenging like crazy intense times crazy intense times for the wedding but I, everything I think went off with without a hitch I think the most surprised that I was was the tattoo artist that we kind of brought in last minute yeah I I did not think that was going to be the most popular thing at our wedding I was like me the people are just so getting funny. tattoos yeah, oh, so, yeah so um probably like two weeks before the wedding I was talking to Eden and I, I asked if we should have a tattoo artist I'm like hey you know what like I'm fully tatted we have friends that are tatted it would be really cool and I really haven't seen it at weddings if we had a tattoo artist we created the flash art mm -hmm, beforehand so cool. we were having a conversation with the tattoo artist and she's like how many people do you think would get tatted at your wedding 
mind you, we had 80 guests at our wedding. It was pretty intimate. And I was thinking to myself, like, okay, well, I'm probably going to get some um, Eden, maybe, you know, a couple friends. I'm like, okay, 30. Like, I'm comfortable with saying 30 people. We, and, and if we don't, we thought 12. Like, yeah. At the top of our, we were like, 12 for sure would get it. Yeah, like but confirmed. then the other, we were like, maybe, yeah. you know, depending. Like, yeah. if they're in the mood and it's like a great party, maybe. And I was like, worst case scenario, I'll just get the remainder. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't mind, you know? I was like, you're going to get 15 sleeves. Like, I'm down. Just add it. It's like, great. Just add them to the rest. Yeah. Of and so like, I was, I'm making the flash. So I'll just make sure it's stuff that I want. And they were yeah. super cute. Very, very super cute. cute and um yeah day of the wedding um we we get there and the the tattoo artist comes to us and she's like I have a waiting list of 40 people and like they <laughs> I had to cut it off because like I think I could have gone to 60 what do you want to do and I'm like damn I did not think it was going to be that yeah. popular and we're like just just go until 40 it's fine she yeah. did not stop she was there from the doors opening to the doors closing <laughs> giving out tattoos like everyone was and I think what it was, because we asked, because there was a lot of first timers. People got their a first time too. That's great. We were like, okay, let's just do it. That's why we were like, we weren't counting for you. We thought the tattoo <laughs> people would get the tattoos. And like the Thias, like Thias from Mexico were we getting tatted that. for their first tattoo. I yeah. was like, Thia, let's have <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> But it, you know what it was? And we asked, they were like, this wedding and this trip was so memorable. They wanted something forever to like always look back and remember this like crazy journey because our wedding was three days. Like we had a whole three day adventure planned for everybody and they just never wanted to forget it. So a tattoo was a no brainer for them. And I was like, oh, mind blown. Okay. Not, what we thought, we, not what we thought was going to be I was like, like I made you guys custom mezcal bottles from scratch <laughs> where I had to go like pull the horse. I like picked the mezcal. We went to this town with no name. We found this guy. Like all of these things. I thought that was going to be the popular thing. Nope. Like custom mezcal that They're we like. I want tats. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It was tattoos. I was like, yeah. oh, okay, cool. Mm. Not the free tacos, not the. Uh, uh. <laughs> the fireworks no it was the tattoos that's awesome yeah. but I get that people want to like remember that experience too and like you said it was like a three-day event um that's yeah. memorable already so you want to like com- yeah. like commemorate that yeah everyone totally. was incredible and I think had an, an amazing moment that that list that we picked was so like very there was a one person there that we didn't want and, and that's that, another thing made a actually difference. with weddings we realized because we kept going back and forth like do you I feel like when it comes to wedding you're kind of forced to invite the people that you kind of inherited over the years or like mm-hmm. friends of a friend or maybe a family friend who you don't really talk to maybe your mom talks to or like is somewhat acquainted with mm-hmm. out of obligation because that's like what you're supposed to do and when we sat down and did our list we both agreed we only wanted people that 100% supported our love mm-hmm. 100% were there for us were amazing friends and we only had like the best things to say about them because we mm-hmm. didn't want any dead weight and yeah. we didn't want to feel weird, awkward on our day, you know, mm-hmm. we wanted to feel as comfortable as possible. Yeah. And That's- everyone was that. Like, I think we, we, there were people that, you know, were invited that got weeded out within the process, but then that was a growing process for us. And it taught us to let go. It taught us to let go of some people that weren't worth holding on to. And if you're not willing to show up for us on the most important day of our lives, then there's no space for you in the circle. And I think as we start to think about, not think about as we're in that, baby journey and like Mm -hmm. that circle should be even stronger because these are these are our you know kids that you're going to be around and all of those things like the wedding kind of helped naturally ease out um I guess like weed out that process and do a friend's cleanse if you will absolutely energy is so important and who you surround yourself with and who you're like bringing into your life in that way especially with like a baby in the process it's very very important to have that so yeah I love that it's been a (laughs) lovely conversation I feel like we could chat forever (laughs) um honestly yeah (laughs) it's so fun fun. um so you're in the process of starting a family what should listeners know about IVF if they're thinking about starting the journey with their partners Uh, I love this question um two things one I think as females we don't realize that there's a internal clock that is ticking away that's a real thing and I think that even if you're thinking about like even if you're on the fence of about kids or you're thinking about kids down the line five ten years from now you should get checked immediately (laughs) like you should go and get your eggs counted you should go and see where your hormone levels are at because that's like step one um when we 
when we wanted to mm-hmm. have kids, it was like when we talked about kids, it was like three years ago. Yeah. Like was- early in our relationship. Like that first U hauling year, we were like, okay, what is the timeline? What do you want? And yeah, it's 2020, like yeah. when the whole world shut down. And now you don't have these distractions. And we're like, okay, let's like seriously talk about this. If this is on the table, then let's like figure out where we're at. Right. Like, and and I assumed, yeah, mm-hmm. like Eden's younger. So I assumed that like Eden mm-hmm. would go first and I would go second. Mm-hmm. And then we went and I got checked and my clock was like, girl, you're late. Like you need to, oh, you yeah. should have had it like yesterday. Her hormone levels were yeah. extremely low, like, and for her, for her age and she's super young. So every, like, we thought we had all this time because, you know, that's what no you, one talks about. You assume like you're young, Definitely you're don't healthy. Talk about it. Yeah. And, and we're like, cool. We're, we're like, we're just going to coast through this. We just want to know how many years we have. Mm-hmm. And the doctor was like, you have no years, you have months. So it's either you do wow. this now or like yeah. the burden's going to fall on me only because I'm, I'm younger than her and my hormone levels were where they should be for my, for my age. And you don't know what you're going to get until you get there and exactly. Jay looks like she I mean on the outside just everything looks super healthy and she's always been a healthy person never gets sick I always get sick and her levels were just you know oh. not where they should be and they really just kind of gave us that that you know information and once you have that information like that's it, true it's power behind it you can make a decision and make a choice so we were like we weren't prepared for this, but now it's like, we got to, you know, get this thing moving and get it happening. So I feel like that was step one, just like getting checked is so important for just females in general. We should Mm -hmm. know, even if you don't want to, I feel like it's like a fun thing to just go do and just see like where you land and how much time you have to make that decision if you want it. And, and then step two, I think for us was finding a donor mm-hmm. like that was because I feel like people think of IVF and they think it's this ex- and it is expensive, mm-hmm. but I think you see it as like a full ticket, ticketed item, right? Like it's just like X amount of money out the door, but you can break it down in sections, which yeah. is what we did, right? We did the text, the testing first, mm-hmm. which our insurance covered, thank God. And then we did the sperm picking because that was like a big chunk. It can be expensive depending on, mm-hmm. you know, who the donor is and, and what you're looking for. And I think when you think of like having a baby and doing IVF, right, it's like buying a house. It's like there's only so many people in this world that could afford to do that thing. And, you know, maybe it's not my journey because it seems so expensive or it's super hard or it's like information overload. And that's just why we love talking about this. And why we're we've talked about in the past and now we're going to bring it back up again on our page to remind people it is 100% possible like Jay and I aren't like made of money we work extremely hard for everything that we have and all that we do and we made it work and you know what this is how we did it we just did it in sections and Mm -hmm. you know breaking it up once you have that information you can like make a plan and plan for how you're going to again cross things off the list and you know do step one and step two and step three and for us step one is just knowing where your levels are and, and again, still take that with a grain of salt because my levels were super like amazing for my, for my age. And then once we, you know, we did IVF with Jay, she had to go through two rounds because, you know, it wasn't easy for her and her hormones and that getting her to like be responsive to the medication was expensive. So we agreed, you know, we had a plan. We were only going to be able to spend this much and like try this many times and she killed it on the second one. And, you know, we have embryos and that's amazing. But then once it came to my turn to do IVF, we ended up finding out that I had endometriosis. So my ability to be able to pull any eggs or any follicles were like slim to none. And so even though my hormone levels were great and and everyone was like, Eden, you're like, you've got time. You're amazing. Like, we're not even thinking about you. We're just going to focus on Jay. I ended up being worse than Jay. And like, whether I was in a straight relationship or gay relationship, this would still be my outcome because of my condition that... I had no idea because I didn't check. I didn't check for it. I wasn't thinking about it. And that's, again, like another reason why we're like, check early, because then you can start doing something about it. I think had I had checked three years ago, I probably could have started a process to take medication or to try different treatments to get this under control. 
But because now we're here and I'm running out of time, my options were to do IVF as well, which I, I, you know, wasn't a part of the plan because we didn't want to spend that kind of money. But right. we're like, okay, we know how much it costs. We've done this twice. This is how much we need to save up roughly. This is what we're going to do. And this is our plan. So like, it's just about having a plan. And we did this over a stretch of like three years. So it wasn't all at once. You know, it wasn't all in one big lump sum. It's like, start asking questions, knowing what it's going to cost and working towards that plan. Mm -hmm. And for us, like, we didn't want to spend more than obviously one round. So I did one round and kind of like whatever we get is what we get. And mm -hmm. that's fine with me. And I got one. <laughs> I got like one and well, one and a half, but like, let's be real. <laughs> it's one. <laughs> and then Jay has seven. So wow. I'm like, okay, well, it's, I'm not going to get egg greedy. Like we have seven plenty, you know, that are here. Definitely. And so it doesn't need to be fine. We have them. So I'll just, yeah. you know, figure it out. And then, yeah, this, and then sperm donor, I think that's super important. We went through a plethora of sperm banks from here to Europe. Wow. Like we, yeah, we did our due diligence when it came to sperm donors and the best one to date that we absolutely love is um cryobank california cryobank mm -hmm. and they have like the the coolest website it's like tinder for like literally sperm sperm donor. Donor. <laughs> like <laughs> baby pictures voice messages essays oh. full background um medical, like, medical record. records like grandparents medical records Every great grandparents medical records oh. it's like so thorough and, and also the, the acceptance rate is extremely hard to get in. Like you really, it takes them a year before they can even donate. So you like, you really want to do this and like give back. We found our sperm donor through there, but it wasn't like overnight. This was yeah. definitely something that took us like almost a full year. It was like eight months. It literally felt it. like buying a house because we would go on there and we would go through like um, profile and profile and profile. And then we would see one that we really liked. Mm hmm because we both have very different requirements too. That's like something that I think queer couples should talk about more is like, you think you're picky with who you date. Wait until you look for your sperm, sperm donor. donor. I like, was going to say. all their ball game. <laughs> yeah. 100%. Because there's so many things you need to like take into consideration. Even when you were saying like just the medical records and the grandparents' medical records, like there's a lot. Totally. And like, I'm, I've always like, when we started this process, I was like, I don't care what he looks like I just want to make sure they have a clean bill of health like no cancers no diabetes I, I have a lot of diabetes and heart conditions in my family mm -hmm. so I was like I just want like beautiful healthy like baby. healthy baby like I don't care what it looks like and Eden over here is like okay six four minimum height <laughs> no like, I said it's six three I'm like, what? I'm I'm like me I'm five two <laughs> like what I'm just five so I want to give them a chance you Aww. know I just want to give them <laughs> Um, and it's not even guaranteed, you know, but like yeah. maybe if I can help in that so, direction. And she's like, you know, colored eyes, maybe. I'm like, what? This is crazy. I mean, if I'm going to pay for it, might as well. That's if I'm so gonna funny. Put it if it's the same price, you know, might as well. Yeah, you're like, let's add a little height on there. <laughs> yeah, I like, used to say, like, it's really interesting. When and I wanted an athlete. And you wanted an yeah. athlete. I'm like, okay, because she used to be a runner. She was a runner her whole life. Yeah, She's it. like an athlete. I'm like, yeah, no big deal. Just like six four, colored eyes, like, actually <laughs> jaw and an athlete. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Oh, my God. That's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> it just we took a long time. that's amazing yeah but I think it's better to like take your time with it right yeah totally yeah. don't rush but definitely like that there. selection process yeah yeah and California cryobank even and they have free trials which is what we tried they have like a 30-day free trial and we gave out on our page like a free promo code yeah. where you can have like a you can just see how the website works for just, free. it's fun like I think it's just a fun thing to do with your partner just to like see what's out there and to just see what you like and what they like I don't know yeah, I think it's that's cool. cool there's no there's no harm in like having it in the bank right like a little savings account like it's just your sperm savings account like when yeah. that time comes at least you know you're ready to go because what you don't want is the doctor to be like you've got no time and now it's going to take you like you feel rushed to find the sperm so it's just 
take your time now if you got time and that this is like a part of that journey we weren't married yet first of all that mm-hmm. we weren't even engaged that wasn't even a conversation but we, we were we like bought sperm together we bought sperm <laughs> together we're like you know at least we're this is where our priorities are telling us to like pivot right now and this is where we're at and that was a part of our journey and again mm-hmm. like to whoever's timeline like your timeline is your timeline. Yeah. And what's really cool about California Cryobank is that if you don't use the sperm, they mm-hmm. do have a buyback program. So they, oh, okay. if you don't use it at all, they will like buy it back. But at least that's an option, which a lot of sperm banks don't even do that. They're yeah. like, like no returns. <laughs> yeah. Like once it's done, it's done sort of thing. Yeah, okay. yeah, exactly. you know, like if you don't use it, they're like, we'll buy it back. And like, yeah. that's awesome. I think that's really great. That's really good. I just learned so much. Like in that whole conversation that's amazing that's now, not scary yeah for sure and I think also just the importance of even like checking to see like where your hormone lo- levels are at like that's something I wouldn't yeah. even think about right now like I'll be 28 later this month but still Do yeah it. everyone's so different yeah just to check I was 20 when I started yeah when we first started this journey I was 28 and oh, okay. I was I was again told that I was going to be coasting through this so it's just so important to check now and like check everything like it, it's just really really critical to at least have that information if that's something that is on your table that you want yeah. down the road because it does take time and yeah. I think it's so important to like when we talk about this too we've said like if we have daughters like I think you should be checking your stuff at like 2021 like just to like see where you're at if you can save for a first car you can save for like this whole process you know like just getting your body ready I would tell my daughter to like freeze her eggs at 25 yeah like freeze them at 25 so then they're forever 25 years old and if that is your journey it did you have bought yourself an infinite amount of time as much time as you want or you don't want yeah. but at least it's on the table for you versus like had I think I'd waited another year it wouldn't even be on the table for me anymore it's barely yeah. on the table for me now and like it, it's just at the end of the day it's cliche as it is it's not fair because mm-hmm. we're all built so different and you don't know what card you're dealt yeah. until you know, for some people, it's super easy. For some people, it's going to be hard. And it's just like, whatever you get is what you get. And it just, it's a sucky feeling when, you know, you want something so bad, but it's not going to be easy for you. So Definitely. I think with our daughter, we're like 25, if, don't, don't get that bag. You better be saving those eggs. <laughs> like that's the bag you need to secure. <laughs> that is good advice, honestly. <laughs> oh, wow. We're trying. <laughs> for sure well honestly yeah. thank you both so much for your time I had so much fun on this interview I, I Sarah was really bummed that she couldn't make it but yeah we're glad we could catch you too and I'm so excited to like just continue to follow your journey and honestly like wish you both all the best it was really good to meet you guys thanks thank you. So this was a great conversation yeah. it, it felt like we were just homies just ca- catching up so yeah. thank you for making it totally Maybe we'll have to come back with Sarah. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Like honestly, come back with Sarah. We'll probably have like, so many more questions for you too. You're so easy to talk to. Where can our listeners find you and keep up with you guys? Yeah. yeah. Uh, everywhere is Eden XJ. We're um, on well, everything. Yeah. <laughs> and also follow our queer movement, Preciosa Night, at mm-hmm. Preciosa Night on yeah. Instagram. But yeah, everything's Eden XJ. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. We really enjoyed it. We had of so much course. fun.